Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about Israel from an Israeli. We need to know everything here on Global Connections. Our guest for the show is Benny Ron. He's an Israeli. He's talking to us from Honolulu, um, but he's really all over. Welcome to the show, Benny. Nice to see you. Uh, Shaloha, Jay. And um, I'm delighted to see you again and be in your show. So tell us about you. Tell us about your experience here at UH. Um, tell us uh, what happened after you left UH and what you're doing now. My experience uh, in UH is a good one. Um, I got my PhD in UH. Wonderful lab, wonderful people, good education. And then after about 12 years, I came back uh, to serve the University of Hawaii as a faculty and as the aquaculture program coordinator. And I had wonderful experience. It gave me the opportunity to build new significant programs. Um, and I, it gave me the opportunity to go all over the Pacific Islands, meet the islanders, and bring about uh, helping with the, with the food security that is needed so much in the Pacific and throughout the world. Yeah, well, you're you're a nonprofit guy. You you're uh, you want to help humanity. I know that from the time I I spent with you when you were here. So let's talk about what happened after you left Hawaii, and what are you doing now, and how are you advancing that goal? Well, after I left the University of Hawaii, uh, I uh, went to Austin, Texas, and I opened a nonprofit organization, um, namely Aquaculture Hub. Uh, which is a big website with uh, over 8,000 members, uh, which is free uh, to anybody who is interested in uh, food security and in sharing, educating um, all what they know about uh, sustainability and about uh, food security, the techniques, the ideas, uh, helping other people. Uh, so I'm big about sharing and free sharing. And um, what sprout from it uh, are two more, I would say, items. One of them is the aquaculture training online learning, uh, shortly, ATOL, that I start doing with the uh, uh, help of uh, the University of Hawaii faculty and students. And uh, it's a program, it's uh, one of the first online um, courses with over 85 videos, about 15 hours of videos with education um, online, because I realized the Pacific is really huge and we have so many time zones. So it must, it must be a synchronous course so everybody can enjoy it and everybody can build their own aquaponics. Uh, and I remember how I learned from my friends, uh, faculty of the University of Hawaii, about the Ahupua'a and how the Hawaiian uh, were always uh, thinking uh, you know, on conservation and sustainability. And I took it up uh, as one of my goals uh, to bring it to the West uh, and, and work with the same kind of thought. Um, and so this course uh, is all over the world. And now, uh, interestingly enough, some of the states, uh, a good example is uh, actually Alabama, who took it uh, as a course that is a credited course by the Department of Education in Alabama. And uh, high school students and um, community college students get credit for taking this course. So I'm working with the teachers, with the students to help them actually learn more about sustainability and build their own systems. So I'm also going over there and working with them and being in their conferences. Um, and in Israel, where I came from originally, uh, I also went there and help uh, people who work in um, aquaculture, actually. I help and advised a lot of the farmers over there. And uh, I was involved also uh, with a lab uh, that was uh, actually 
uh, the Central uh, Fish Health Laboratory for the Ministry of Agriculture and help over there. And I'm still in in, in um, contact with them and with the farmers. Uh, and they advise me, um, and I'm advising whatever I can. And I go there and listen and try to help. Uh, other, other product that I have, as I said, is uh, the Israeli Journal of Aquaculture. It's a journal that actually sprout from uh, the area. It's what's called in Israel the northern east valleys um, in Israel, um, and it's right now situated in kibbutz near David. And uh, over there, uh, what's happening from this lab over there uh, that used to help a lot of people and still helping a lot of farmers uh, take care of the fish, uh, sprout a journal. This journal uh, that started in Hebrew became very quickly a journal in English. And with the time, uh, the Ministry of Agriculture dropped the ball on it. And nobody else was taking care of this journal. And the journal was supposed to be closed. So I took it under my sponsorship. I'm sponsoring the journal. And right now, the journal is actually home uh, in Austin, Texas, at the Aquaculture Hub. Uh, and uh, this is an open access journal. So anybody in the world who is who wants to read the papers for free is uh, welcome to it. Well, you know, as before, you're very altruistic and um, you're very global minded. And, and that's consistent with the whole notion of making the desert bloom um, in Israel. Um, and, I, and I think you're kind of doing that on a larger scale. And I know that in Hawaii, we have a problem with food security. So many other places do. So you're you're in the right lane on this. And I appreciate that, Benny. Let's talk about Israel. Uh, you're not there, but certainly you're following what's going on. You have friends, families, business associates in Israel. Uh, from your vantage, from talking to them, communicating with them, what's the status of the war right now? Uh, from the news I'm getting uh, in the last few days, uh, it seems that right now uh, Israel is actually surrounded from all sides almost. Um, we have the Hamas in um, Gaza, uh, El Arish, Rafiach region, um, and the war is still going on there, and more and more tunnels are found and blown up. Um, and uh, actually, the Israeli military is quite capable um, and is destroying uh, most of the units of the Hamas, and many of them are scattered all over. Um, and so they are uh, weakened. The Hamas is weakened significantly at this point in time. And uh, we have a problem, a, a dramatic and really major problem in northern Israel, where basically the government decided to give up on a major part of the north in Israel. Uh, instead of uh, moving the war into the Lebanon region, where the missiles are coming from, Israel basically retreated, took out all the civilians, moved them to other places, um, and the region is becoming uh, a target. And nonstop uh, missiles are, and uh, you know, and drones are attacking the region. The region is in flames. Uh, many of the kibbutzim and um, and uh, uh, you know, a city like Kiryat Shmone are basically ruined. Um, they have they will have to rebuild it uh, from from the bottom up, um, and that's terrible because uh, again, and we can talk about it later. How the government just basically giving up on on certain regions, like they gave up on the south, uh, the region that is close to the Gaza Strip, and they gave right away. Uh, over the uh, control on the northern part of Israel. This never happened before, never, uh, from the day the state of Israel was founded. And we have, of course, war coming from the east, uh, from Iran, and from all the proxies of Iran, which are sitting like the Houthis um, and certain 
uh, faction of the Iranians uh, sponsored um, uh, units sitting in Iraq. I know that also the Americans are suffering from them and uh, they were able to kill and, and wound uh, American troops at that region. Uh, so basically, uh, Iran throughout the years was able uh, to create uh, a circle of fire around Israel. And it took years and they did it very well. And that's right now when we talk about actually shooting and war, um, that is the situation in Israel right now. Um, interestingly enough, and something that caused a lot of Israelis, especially those who had to leave their homes in the north and in the south uh, of Israel, uh, uh, people are angry that when there is any threat on Tel Aviv area, the government is all up and running and trying uh, to fight it and try to show that they can uh, do something. Um, I mean, uh, you know, go back and and shoot the Iranian or kill somebody uh, important uh, for the Hamas or Hezbollah or, or in Iran, uh, because it's like Tel Aviv is uh, like the most important place in the world uh, for the for this government, while they're giving up totally uh, of the south and the north of Israel, which is really caused a lot of people uh, to be very angry. What about October 7th? Um, how do you feel? How do, how do your friends and family um, in Israel feel about what happened on October 7th? Well, October 7th uh, was one of those shocks. Uh, I mean, from the point of view uh, for the Americans, okay? This is Pearl Harbor or 9-11. The interesting thing about those kind of cases that you will always remember where you were standing or sitting or what did you do at that moment when you heard about Pearl Harbor? And that's what my dad told me, uh, that he remembered that exactly what he was doing when he heard about Pearl Harbor, exactly what he heard and when it, he heard what he did and where he was when uh, President Kennedy was murdered. And uh, the same is about 9-11. Uh, so if you think about those occasions, those horrific occasions that shoot right into your heart and, and, and cause you a, a shock, um, it, that's what happened in, in, in October 7th. Uh, anyone in Israel um, really was hurting and was in shock. And I think that everyone everyone in Israel has a trauma. They are in different stages of trauma, different level of trauma. It depends who you are, your personality, or how close you, you've been hurt. Is somebody from your family, a direct family member was killed or, or, or friends, or you were close by with the event itself, part of it, um, or you were just totally in a in a sitting in a uh, in a cafe in Tel Aviv and you heard about that or you saw it on TV it doesn't matter everybody i think in different level uh has their own trauma and and it doesn't wear away you know um day after october 7th posters of the hostages were were being tacked on telephone poles in the US in major cities um, but what was remarkable is that just as fast as they were being tacked on the telephone poles, there were people who were ripping them off the telephone poles, and um, almost as if um, they had planned to do that. Um, and then, of course, you had um, all these protests, and the protests were not not against Hamas for having committed these atrocities on October 7th. They were in favor of the Palestinians and essentially in favor of Hamas uh, in the United States, in major cities. And, and through the summer, this past summer, um, that's been going on, and it is still going on on, on multiple college campuses. People, uh, people feel that it comes from BDS, uh, Boycott, Divest, and Sanction, 
and that BDS uh, is being controlled and funded by Iran and, and uh, its proxies. But my question to you is, um, how do people in Israel, your friends, family, associates, how do they feel about the American reaction on the campuses and in the cities? Well, I, I will answer it in two parts. The first part is the emotional part, right? That That's what bother you, and that's how you conceive it and how you bring it to me. Well, uh, on the emotional part, on the emotional part uh, it hurts. It hurts to see that people cannot empathize with people who their homes with was burned, their family and friends and kids were murdered, burned. I mean, how can people cannot comprehend that the Hamas, those people who came from Gaza into those kibbutzim, burned babies in ovens alive. Can you imagine something like that? People who, they cut their heads with a shovel and raped young girls, young women. And you know what? Rape is rape is rape. And it doesn't matter who is being raped and who is the appropriate, who, who did the rape. It doesn't matter. It's rape. And the United States, and you talk about people who, 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 who took off posters. Why don't we talk about presidents of universities? Those institutions that's supposed to be the pinnacle of example, of education, of giving, tell, tell many people around the world, come and learn in our institutions because we are above all those things. They didn't empathize at all. Now, that's the emotional part. So you feel betrayed, right? You feel betrayed. You feel you were raped twice, once by the Hamas, and another time with people that you thought that they are in a different level of education and empathy. And it didn't happen. It, you got the opposite. Now, let's put the emotional part aside just so I can explain why, in, in a way, first of all, there's no excuse for a person not to empathize with another person when they hurt, okay? Because that's part of what I'm doing in my work, in my everyday work, is to empathize with people, okay? It's giving people whatever I can to help them go with their life, to help them raise the family, and, and help them uh, feed themselves with healthy food, Okay? So that's what I believe in, and, and I think that's the basic stuff of every human being to survive. Uh, they, need, uh, they need water, they need food, and they need love, okay? So that's the basic, and we felt, many people in Israel felt betrayed, betrayed by the Americans who do that. There were many Americans who were on the sides of Israel, including, of course, I cannot forget, is the president of the United States, uh, you know, Joe Biden, who many Israelis adore. They think is, this guy is just full of heart. And, and he showed that. I mean, he met with people that Netanyahu to these days doesn't want to meet with. I'm talking about families of hostages that he is avoiding. He didn't go, Netanyahu didn't go to to this day, he didn't go to most of the funerals. He doesn't show himself. He doesn't empathize with those people while President Biden was full of heart and, and called people and talked to people and told them, call me whenever you, you need me. I'll talk to you and I'll help you, okay, mentally and in other ways by fighting uh, for a deal with the Hamas uh, to uh, bring back uh, the hostages. Now, I want to explain something that has, you know, not so emotional, okay? We're getting emotional here, but we need to just to explain something. Let's go back to understand what happened in the Middle East. 
what happened in Egypt, what happened in Saudi Arabia. These places sprout. They were the birth of the Islamic Brotherhood. Okay? Don't forget the Islamic Brotherhood. The Islamic Brotherhood actually had a plan to insert itself everywhere around the world. Not only in Israel, or not only in the countries around Israel. Come on. The, the, the Islamic Brotherhood had a, a global major plan that, and they did it smart because they said, oh, we need to do it very quiet and penetrate everywhere. And they were able to do it. And they did it uh, if, I mean, you know, uh, uh, we, we had those people that eventually caused the 9-11, right? Remember them? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the Islamic Brotherhood started it, okay? So the Islamic Brotherhood, one of the places that they got hold of and actually the government, whoever related to it, uh, uh, is working for the uh, Islamic Brotherhood, is Qatar. Okay, now Qatar is playing both ways. And that's the trick here. Qatar brings money, tons of money, into the United States. They pay uh, universities. They pay people who are serving in politics. I don't want to go too deep into it because it might be a legal issue, but they pay politicians. They pay judges. They pay many people everywhere in the United States, in Europe, and already in Europe, there are um, evidence that they paid certain politicians, and those politicians, some of them, when they had the proof, they kicked them out. But they pay a lot of people around the world. They sponsor them to the point, like the universities in, in the United States, those big universities that the president is afraid to say that there was a rape. And the same in the UN. Me too. They don't talk about the rape in Israel. How come? They're women. They're supposed to protect women. They're supposed to talk about me too. And there was a lot of me too in, in, in uh, October 7. Oh, no, we don't talk about that. So it's all about the money and the Islamic Brotherhood were smart. They outsmarted all those leaders in the West. And I tell you one thing, and we can see it already. When Israel had the first uh, airplane hijacked, okay? And it went in early to, if you remember, to Algeria. And everybody said, oh, it's the Israeli problem. We don't care. And there was another one. And there was Entebbe, if you remember very well. They made movies on it, remember? So they thought, oh, that's Israel problem. No, guys, it's going to go all over the place. And then the U.S. got it in 9-11, and they still didn't learn the lesson. This was the Islamic Brotherhood. That's the source of Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda sprout from the Islamic Brotherhood. When, did, when will the West check itself and fix the problem? And there was a unit in the Mossad. And it, it seems like I'm jumping, but I'll show you how it's connected. There used to be uh, a unit in the Mossad that actually knew how to get rid of those guys or cut them down. It, that unit was dealing with money. And you know what? Those, as, as you know, the leaders, usually the leaders like Arafat and the rest of the Hamas uh, uh, leaders, they are billionaires. Billionaires. How come they are billionaires? Or oh, they were billionaires. Those like, you know, Hania is already somewhere else, right? He's gone. But he was a billionaire. 
he the estimate was that he had like four billion dollars. Come on. If you are like you were trying to say freedom fighter, how come you're a billionaire? He's supposed to, to do something to help your people, right? Not to make money. So what happened is uh, uh, those guys are actually making sure that the people at the bottom, the citizens or the Palestinians who live in Gaza Strip and elsewhere, going to continue to be poor people. And they're going to use the money, those leaders are going to use the money for themselves, and they use the money for weapon, and they use the money to aggravate, and to come into uh, a lot of Muslims somewhere else, and to other, and other non-profit around Europe and the United States, and said, oh, we are freedom, uh, uh, you know, fighters, give us more money, give us more money, while making sure that the people the simple person uh, that works in the shop, they try to go to school and get education, they're going to stay poor and they cannot go forward. They cannot go anywhere. They cannot bring their heads up. Okay? So we are in a system that is uh, worse for the world because if you give people uh, a good education, if you give people raise them uh, to the upper level, feed them better food, give them better health, they are not going to fight because their lives are complete. Their lives are normal. But you cause them to suffer and to curse every day of their life, of their life. then they're going to be always angry. And that's how they, they do the system. So now in the U.S., when you talk about those people who are totally uneducated, all totally, their brain is washed with stupid things and with money. They pay for those protests. Nobody pay me to go out with my shirt shouting, crying to save the hostages. Nobody pays me. I pay them. If they ask for money, I give them money just so we can cry out and request bring back the hostages now. But those people who go against, they are uneducated because they're just followers of somebody. They don't know even what they're talking about, okay? It's like when you talk about, um, let's say, lesbians, for example, okay? Okay, all those people, they don't know that, or maybe they should learn, that they, they cannot be lesbian with the with a Palestinians or with the with a, uh, Islamic. They're going to get rid of them. When they go and they protest, oh, them, what are you talking about? Those people are going to get rid of you the moment you're going to be there. It's against their Sharia. It's against their law. Okay? So it, all those people who think that, oh, yeah, freedom, it's not for freedom. And it goes into the United States, in the veins, into the nerves, and it might ruin the U.S., and Europe, if they're not going to wake up and do something about it. By the I way, wanna, I want to pick sure. up on. I got. I want to make sure one more point. I'm not talking about all the Muslims. God forbid. I don't talk about all the Muslims. There are many, many, many people, good people, who believe in the Quran. And they are good people, and they actually despise what the Hamas did. They are in shock what the Hamas did. It's not acceptable to a lot of people what the Hamas did. That's not in the Quran. That's not the right Quran that they're talking about. Okay? That's insane. And I have good friends that are Muslims. I have good friends uh, that served in the Israeli military that they are Muslims. I have good friends that uh, are, are working with me in Israel, when it comes to agriculture, when it comes on building facilities, uh, we are sitting together, we speak the same language, we eat together, they will never do something like that. But this is something satanic, something that is not Islamic, it's even beyond the what's written in the Quran. 
and the money give them or the money uh, cause them to afford it and to cause other people to go after them and support them it's because of the money so that unit that I'll tell you about in the Mossad used to follow the money because money moves. It's not only when money sits, it's with the, you know how the money moves. That's the trick, to find where the money moves and cut it off. And that's what the unit in the, in the Mossad used to do. Until, and by the way, you know who started it? It was Dagan, the head of the Mossad, with, together with Ariel Sharon. Who cut that unit and stopped it? Guess, give me the name. Who you think did that? What prime minister stopped that unit? Netanyahu. Ah, Netanyahu was the one who made sure the Hamas will get cash, a lot of money from Qatar to the Hamas to build the tunnels, to get the weapons. And when, when there was agreement, that Qatar will bring money, will move the money to Israel so Israel can give it to the Palestinian people who suffers. The idea was that they will do it via the bank in Gaza. So the bank gives a check to the person directly, okay? So they can get a salary, they can go buy food to their family, whatever, education, whatever, medicine. Netanyahu, Stop that. And he said, no, it has to be in cash, in suitcases, in cash. And you know, cash is something that can flow everywhere, right? And that cash, I don't know how much was going into some of the Israelis. And I don't know who are there. But it was supposed to go to Gaza to the hands of the Hamas, cash. So that cash didn't go to the Palestinian people in Gaza. It didn't help them. Uh, uh, financially, it doesn't have their the economy over there. It went to build more tunnels. Okay, when um, the government that was what called, we call it the the change government, if you remember, uh, that came about with Naftali Bennett as a prime minister. Naftali Bennett stopped the cash. He said, "No, it has to go through the banks." Okay, so his money from Qatar started going to again to the banks and to give checks to people. When Bibi won again, he stopped that. He said, let's go back to the cash. So guys, it's all about the money, both of what's going on in the US and what's going on in Israel in, in the Gaza Strip. How do you feel about uh, Netanyahu's efforts to recover the, the hostages and his uh, ongoing statement that he wants to eliminate Hamas, uh, which doesn't sound very easy even now. Um, is he effective in either of those particulars? The simple answer is no. But it's more complicated than that. Okay? Um, you have to realize that Netanyahu, for over, I don't know, 20 years or more, even, is thinking about Netanyahu, not about the Israelis. That's a key point. If you understand that, you understand everything that you can see. Because Netanyahu, the, the day that uh, he, he knew that he has to go to court because of embezzlement and bribe or whatever, okay, so he has few, few court issues that you know, he has to deal with. And what he's doing all these years is trying to, you know, spread it out into time to, to the future, not to fix it and not to go in and show that he is innocent and get rid of it. Maybe because he knows that he is not innocent. I don't know. But we never came to the point. He was able... Uh, 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 to to uh, uh, postpone it all the time to the point where they never finish the trial. And this is his goal. 
Now, the moment he knew he has to go to trial, he decided, and his wife was saying it, that they don't mind that the state of Israel we bur will burn if he cannot be the prime minister. When something like that happened, you understand everything. Uh, he is willing to burn the country if he, he is not if he is not the prime minister. So when you come out with this, we, you understand that formula. You understand a lot of things that are happening now. The current situation is such that in order to be elected, BB actually took with him into his coalition, uh, which is um, uh, becoming like a messianic coalition, a uh, misanthropic <laughs> coalition, where he has uh, on one side Ben Greer and the other side Smotrich. And these two people are a follower of Kahana, if you remember. Okay, so Kahana, in the past, when Kahana was in the Knesset, okay, in the Israeli parliament, and he went up to speak, all the Likud members left the hall. That was in the past, you know, okay, during Shamir time and other prime ministers, okay, because they were against the messianic message that he was talking about. He was talking about of getting rid of the Palestinians in Israel, make a transfer, and then the Jews are supposed to rule from Iraq to end of Egypt. That's it. Because he found out somewhere it was saying that God told somebody in the in the Old Testament. Said, okay, so it's all ours. Without even thinking, without even understanding. It does, they don't care. You see, those people are messianic and their brain is washed. They don't care if Israel go to hell. Because when Gogu Magog, I don't know if you if if you know this term, it's called Gogu Magog. That means the big war that will destroy everything will bring the Messiah. And everything will be cool. So they don't mind that there will be atomic bombs and everything will be destroyed. Then the Messiah will come. Okay? So he, Bibi was making deal with them. Be in my government. I'll give you, you know, you're going to be ministers. And he made one uh, a minister, Ben Gvir, made him in charge of the police. Can you believe? A guy that was indicted as a criminal. A guy that was uh, hanging the picture of Baruch Goldstein, okay, a messianic Jew that went to the Me'arat HaMachpelah, okay, to a mosque, and killed 29 people. I mean, just people who came to pray, Palestinians. And he, he, he put his picture in his house as a, as the, as a, as a holy man. That's, that's Ben Gvir, now in charge of the Israeli police, in charge of security, a criminal, indicted criminal, okay? The, the Shabak used to follow him and check it out, what he's doing, because he was threatening Rabin. He said, we'll get to you, Rabin. He, he was able to, to break part of, you know, the, 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 the part from, from the car, from the Rabin car, and showed it in a video to say, or in a picture, you see, I was able to get part of your car. I'm going to get to you. And this guy now in charge of security in Israel. And the other guy, a messianic too, Smotrich, he made him in charge of treasury, Ministry of Treasury. And what he, this guy is doing is basically making sure the money will go to settlements. The money will go to messianic groups. Okay? The, the, you have to understand also that after uh, Sharon said, uh, we need to leave 
the Gaza Strip. If you remember, a lot of the, uh, uh, let's say, um, settlements that were around Gaza Strip, in the Gaza Strip, uh, Netanyahu, uh, Sharon said, we need to move out. Sharon, that was, I would say, the father of settlements, realized in a particular point of time, it's not going to work. We need, you know, to separate. We need to separate from them, from the Palestinians. We cannot, we cannot do that. So he said, okay, I hope, it's he hope that if he will take all those, uh, um, you know, settlement flows to the Gaza Strip, from the Gaza Strip, that peace will prevail, that the Gaza people will go and grow food over there, will go and, and feed themselves. Uh, they're going to be farming over there. Well, we got the Hamas instead, okay? But that's what Sharon's idea was to do that. So for, this was trauma to a lot of, uh, uh, um, uh, I would say, religious Zionists. It was a trauma what Sharon did, okay? Right away after that, they built, uh, I would say it's like, a, like an underground organization called Kohelet, okay? If you remember, there's one book in the in the Bible that's called Kohelet, right? So they built Kohelet, and that organization was saying, we're going to penetrate everywhere in the local government, in the upper government, everywhere we're going to penetrate. We're going to penetrate the military, and we're going to change the whole, I would say, politics, uh, all the politics, the whole idea of Israel into messianic Israel. And you know what? All of this, we were people like me and, and my friends and people in the academia, people in, in, the, in the high tech, okay? Uh, people who were, you know, at the top level of economics and all so forth, okay? Top uh, uh, officers in the military. We fell asleep. We didn't know it happening. Or we didn't want to know. Okay? We thought, no, these are our, our brothers. Am I right? You know, when was the wake-up call? There were two wake-up calls. One, when Bibi's uh, misogynic and Messianic government took over after Ben Greer, after um, um, Lapid's government, okay, took over. And Bibi come with Ben Gvir on his right and Smotrich on his left and the rest of those, you know, Messianic guys. And they were going with this Levine, the minister uh, of, um, of justice, and starting to, they came up democratically and they want to, in state dictatorship. And when they started with, with over 200 different, you know, uh, a law suggestion in the parliament, okay, with bills, with over 200 bills to cut down justice, to cut down freedom to people, to tell uh, young people and young women and young teenagers that if you go on a bus, you need to sit at the back. Huh? How about that? Remember those times in the United States? There were people who had to sit in the back of the bus. That's what they wanted to do to women. That there were young women, and you can find them in Hawaii, uh, everywhere, right? That they go with sandals or flip-flop. They go with shorts and tank top, right? That's normal in, in Hawaii. Bus drivers who were part of it, part of this idea with a messianic and with so-called Jewish religious ideas, which really a lot of uh, rabbis don't agree with that, told those girls, get out of the bus. You cannot go on the bus. You need to cover yourself. This is where people like me said, what? That's what will happen to my grandchildren? 
my green children, my, the girls, I have two uh, uh, granddaughters, beautiful and smart. They're going to sit in the back of the bus? It was a wake-up call. And we went to the streets. We said, no, we need democracy here. We need to fight for democracy. It, it cannot be. We cannot believe that Netanyahu used democracy to install dictatorship. But you see, the religious people everywhere, you know what? It doesn't matter what religious. The fundamentalists, you know, those that are in the right end, they want to make sure that all of us will have dictatorship and they will tell us what to do. And our personal freedom that is installed in the Israeli uh, uh, um, Declaration of Independence, and the same from the United States, right? It means freedom to the individual. And that's what they were trying to take away from us. We woke up and they realized they do it for years and we were asleep. We, we didn't notice or we didn't want to notice. This is when we went to the streets. And the second time was October 7. When we saw that because of Netanyahu, all the money that was going to Gaza was building them, a building a, a monster, a satanic monster that kills our citizen without the military able to even fight them because Benville and Bibi and Smotrich caused big battalions, big units at Simchat Torah, days before it happened, to move to the West Bank in order to secure the Sukkot. You know what is a Sukkah? Remember? So to, to, to help those guys, they moved the units over there. So there was no guard over there. We realized that these guys are not for us. We, in the first month, the first month, after October 7th, the government was in shock. They didn't do anything. They were totally dismembered. Nothing. And Bibi claimed, of course, I'm not responsible. Nobody told me. Come on. You know what? I can show you the, the shirts and, and, and the signs that I'm drawing and going out. And it says, you're the head. You're responsible. And if it was in the U.S. or somewhere else, the president will go down right away after that. Supposed to be. Okay? No. He, he, he said nobody told me, which is a lie, of course. I mean, the guy is, a, you know, we, we, we know liars, right? You have liars also in, 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 the, in the United States, right? I don't have to say it twice. That they, you know, we, we have a joke about, about Bibi. You know how does he lie? He opens his mouth. That's the way you know he lies. And, and, and you know somebody like that in the United States too, right? So they lie. They didn't do anything. The organization that I was part of it, Fighting for Democracy, called uh, uh, Brothers and Sisters in Arms. That means those who used to be reservists, uh, old-timer like me, they were officers, I mean, soldiers and officers in military, and we did, we paid our dues. We went into our missions, we went to our uh, uh, wars, okay? And we, many of us still suffer from it, okay? We are veterans. We got together to fight for democracy. On October 7th, on the morning of October 7th, our organization flipped 180 degrees and said, we rush now to the kibbutzim around Gaza. We rushed to Nir Oz. We rushed to uh, little towns like Ofakim and Zderot. And we'll save the people who pull them out. And we'll give them oh, the soldiers. The, the soldiers didn't have enough equipment. People didn't have the clothes. They left the house. Our organization, the uh, brothers and sisters in arm, went in with cars. 
brought those people from, from the fire of hell out. Not the government. None of the ministers did that. None of the ministers went down to see it. Bibi never went there at the first month to see what's happening and help them. We did. And then we organized special areas in Tel Aviv area uh, um, under, under like a museum and other places where you have parking lots that are, uh, because we got a lot of rockets coming in, so they were safe, okay? Parking lots, underground parking lots. And it became center for volunteers Two kinds of volunteers. Those who brought non stuff clothing, uh, um, all kind of uh, equipment, toys for, for the kids, okay? Food, huge centers, okay? Strategic centers, okay? And those people brought it, and I myself and, and even my family and others used to come there in the morning and work all day and organize everything in boxes. And okay, all the toothbrush and, and, and toothpaste in this one, and, uh, and the toys for the kids in this one, and you label everything. And, you, and there were cars coming in, pouring what people came from, brought it from the house. Companies built, I mean, bought tons of stuff and, you know, volunteered and brought it in. And after we organized everything, and there was a big line of young people sitting with their laptops to make sure everything is organized, going into the right place. Where do we need it? All over the country. And there were flow of cars going out with the boxes, with address. There were uh, addresses over there. They knew this guy need that. Those group need that. I myself, I got phone calls from Israeli mothers in the United States to ask me, my son, he rushed to the help in the war, but they need underwears, they need coats, they need uh, uh, helmets, they need this and that. And I was helping organize it to make sure his unit get it. I myself drove my car on Fridays to bring uh, uh, um, food, dinners, people in Israel, uh, uh, private people in their homes. They would start making meals for the Shabbat, for, this, for the units. And, and those, some of those soldiers are gone already. They were, they were killed. People who I drove, I, I used to go get the food, put it in my car and drive there all the way in to bring them the meals to the soldiers. So they have warm, homey food for the weekend for the Shabbat. The government wasn't there. Netanyahu wasn't there. ben wasn't there. Shmoti Twain and all the rest of them that, that what they do for years and even more so now is something you need to learn about. And it's called the poison machine. Have you heard of the poison machine? Well, Americans don't know about that. But Netanyahu has a poison machine. He controls the media. Every dictator, the first thing they do, controlling the media. The second thing, bringing down the justice, the justice, the Supreme Court, and planting in their people. That's the second thing they do. You want to see how it works? Look at Russia with Putin. Or look at Hungary with Urban. That's classical. And by the way, in the United States, did you happen to see who is friend with Putin and Urban? Hmm. You're going to get a president who, who is a friend with them, and you're going to get what they have and what they do in, in, in the United States. They're going to do it here. We have um, two things working here, three things. We have Netanyahu. After all of that, one wonders why he's still in office, because the world measures Israel by the fact that he's still in office. Um, but the second part is there must be all kinds of economic damage happening. Not only those kibbutzim on the Lebanese border, um, but the kibbutzim on the south too. Um, and people worried and maybe not going to work the same way. 
Um, they're in the army. They don't they don't take their regular jobs. The economy is is under threat. The whole country is under threat. And very likely this is an existential threat. Uh, so how serious is this threat? What is the future of Israel? First of all, uh, the the threat is is there. It's true. Uh, Israel will not exist like that for long. Um, you have to realize certain things that you ask. You have you have your question. You had you had a few questions basically. So I, let me break it up. The first question you ask is how come Netanyahu is still there? The answer is democracy. What happened is when you have when democracy uh, vote when the people vote in democracy and you got a president or a prime minister that is ruining the country, what can you do? As long as he is the prime minister, as long as somebody is a president, could you do anything? Did the United States did anything when they got a president that they thought that it's not really uh, meet the standard, let's put it in a very gentle way. Nothing happened. They did it all the way to the end of the term, right? And that's what happened in Israel. As long as democracy, you say, I cannot, I cannot come and fight for democracy and ask for a putsch. It, it doesn't work because that's not democracy, okay? Uh, uh, those putsch you can do in certain countries, but it's not democratic, right? So... It's, it's for me, you see, also is a principle. We are fighting in the streets. When I say fighting, it's protest. In the street. Since Netanyahu government started pushing for, uh, I would call it, um, judicial revolution. You know what I mean? To change the courts. To make the courts be their puppy. Okay? Then we went to the streets. Right, but we have a principle: no violence. We never use violence. If a cop will come to push me, I will put my hands like that, or like that, or behind my back. I will never touch a cop, even if he's gonna beat me. I will never touch a cop. I will never resist a cop. And we suffer from them. We've been beaten. We've been taken into the police. Okay, we were. People were putting in jail, and they never raised their hand. They never did anything bad to the to the officers or to the cops or to anyone. That's the principle. The good thing is that we have lawyers who go right away to the police station, and they go right away to the court. Luckily, the judges, what's called the lower court, okay? are still human beings and not all of them are bought by Netanyahu. And they release them within hours. But the police now is making new, uh, is, is uh, uh, going into new tricks. Because if they put you in one particular station, okay, they hold you in a particular station uh, for certain hours, they, they, that person has to see the judge in a certain time. It cannot be just forever there. So what they do when the time comes to go to the judge, they move you to another station. So now they have to wait over there. So they do all kinds of tricks because of Ben Gvir now in charge of the police. And he tells them, just, you know. And he gives promotions. He tells them, if you beat those guys that protest for democracy, you get a promotion. Do you know that they, they send into us hand grenades. Ah, how about that? They send us, they, they throw at us hand grenades, a shocking hand grenades, and people are injured. They promote those officers and those cops that throw those hand grenades. I mean, it's insane. Okay? So with all that, we protest, but we are not violent. And we are for democracy. So this is, can answer you why we cannot. 
with our principle, take Netanyahu down. And we nobody gonna hurt him. Although he is trying to say, I'm miserable, I've been threatened. It's BS because we don't do this kind of thing. And we said that and we continue to behave like that. You wouldn't find one protester that hit a policeman, none of them, or hit a minister or, or a Knesset member. There's no such thing, okay? What we do, we go close to the house and we sing, or we put signs. We tell them, okay? Or we sit in a park next to the house on Saturday morning and, and we eat over there. We eat. And the police doesn't like that. And they beat people and, and take them to jail because they sit in a park close to the Knesset member or Likud member because they sit down over there and kumbaya. But they didn't hurt anybody and it's not against the law in, in, a, in, a, in, a, public, in a public park to sit. But still, they try. So we cannot do anything about that. But what we try to do is to convey to the Likud members, we need about five of them, five of them, that will say, that will help us with uh, a vote to take down the government and announce elections. We need election day to, to do it democratically. We cannot do it in a different way. We are not gonna do it in a different way. So democracy is in our blood. We are not gonna give up on democracy. We are not gonna give up on uh, freedom uh, of people. And it doesn't matter what race they are, what gender they are, in what they believe. We, we, we are not, we, we want freedom, totally freedom, and to obey the law, because we obey the law. We want them to obey the law. They don't obey the law. Many things that they do, this government, and many of the of the ministers, they 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 just don't go by the rules and don't go by the law, and Bibi allow them to do that. So let me, it, it, you know, in Israel we have a joke. Okay, let me humor you. In a swimming pool, the lifeguard is shouting, "Hey, Bibi, you get out, get out of the pool, and go home. I don't want to see you anymore." So then, what did I do? You pee in the pool. And BB saying, but but you know, probably there are others are peeing in the pool, right? In the swimming pool. I said, yes. But you pee on the heads of the swimmers from the jumping board. <laughs> and that's exactly what he's doing. So let's go from there to the question of where where is this all going? Israel, if it will continue in this uh, um, line, it's, there's going to be no Israel. The, in my opinion, in, in many expert opinion, the only way Israeli, Israel as a state can survive is if we're going to have two states. We need to have a Palestinian state and an Israeli state. If there's going to be only one state, it's not going to be an Israeli state. That's what we came to this conclusion a long time ago. Um, and now it became really clear. And the reason is that one of the reasons is demographics, OK? Um, and the other thing is that nobody wants to be in war forever. Nobody wants to be in war forever. It, it cannot continue like that. And if we talk about um, individuals and human rights and freedom to individual, I want to make sure that also the Palestinians will have the same human rights that I have. If they're not going to have the, the 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 citizens of Palestine, if there will be, a, I, hopefully there will be a state of Palestine. If the if the citizens of 
uh, uh, Palestine will not have the same rights that I have in an Israeli state, it, it cannot work. We need to, to, you know, thrive for that thing and think about this thing and, and, and want this thing. Because if, if you want to have good relationship uh, with, with your neighbors, um, they should feel equal in rights to you. And, and this way, uh, uh, um, you can have relationship. Uh, you have a common denominator. Uh, you, you have common um, ideas and dreams to go about. Uh, so we must have two states in order for Israeli state to, to survive in this region. If there will be, again, I'm repeating, if there will be only one state, it's not going to be an Israeli state. So, Benny, now, you've got an election going on here. Um, you, you've seen, you know, all the um, debates and speeches and what have you, conventions uh, in this country. And uh, they have different positions on Israel, on Netanyahu, on the two-state solution and so forth. Uh, how how will this election coming here soon affect the future of Israel? Okay, that's that's a it's it's a complex question, um, and uh, we need to look at it from from different type. I mean, different angles. It's 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 not you know that the worst thing to do is to look at things as flat, you know, and and like one side. Uh, um, so we need to think about, uh, for example something that you didn't bring it at all in it, uh, and we need to take it in consideration, is the, the Jewish people in the United States. They have their own opinion. Most of the Jewish people in the United States are reforming Jews. You know what is reforming Jews, right? There's a big difference than conservatives or ultra-conservatives and ultra-messianic. So, so, so it's like it's never religious, right? Uh, even if you are a Christian. There's no one Christian, what kind of Christian? There are many kinds of Christians, okay? And each of them obviously believe that they are right, and all the rest of them don't know what they're talking about. And everyone think that they have a direct direction to God, and, and the God tell them what to do, and, and all the rest, they don't have their telephone lines to God. I mean, the world is crazy, and it's true with is Islam and other religions. Now, most in my opinion, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that most of the Jewish people in the United States are reforming Jews. Okay? And they look at Israel as a place of strength for themselves. They, they need Israel over there. Okay? Even if they will never go there. Or, I mean, many of them are going there. And even if they're not going to actually live there, they want Israel to be there for them. Okay? Now, uh, 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 they are not believing in the same thing that the extreme Judaism guys like, you know, like Ben Gvir and, and Smotrich and ultra Orthodox, they look at the reform, uh, the reforming uh, movement in the United States as um, something that will ruin Judaism. They're against them. Now, suddenly you have a prime minister that takes sides. He's, if he is with them, he's against the Jewish people in the United States. But the Jewish people in the United States used to support Israel in the Congress and, and other places. And suddenly they are basically confused. And, 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 and they are, um, uh, you know, they don't know what to do. I mean, to be with Israel, against Israel. I mean, they are Americans after all. First of all, they have American citizenship. Uh, they're going to obey the president. Uh, they must because this is the president. This is the country. They, they are holding American passport. So you put them in binds. You put them in a, a, a very hard position, all those Jewish people, the Jewish community. What are you going to do? And, and, and suddenly... Uh, uh, um, some of the representatives in, in the Congress, uh, Bibi, throw 
murdered them. It doesn't look good. Okay. We have to find a way to live together. They believe in democracy, and they see that Israel is moving away from democracy. They, they hear Bibi and his alliance in the government throwing mud at Biden. That's insane. The same guy that actually supported them more than anyone else. They throw mud at him. So you put the Jewish community in the United States in a really, really bad position. Okay, now to come and say which president will be better to, to, to the Israelis, I think that I don't remember any president that was bad for Israel. Bottom line, I don't, th I don't remember. All the presidents that I, in my lifetime at least, were helping Israel. And every, every president, every new president that come that, be, that is being elected is saying, we have long time relationship with Israel and we'll continue to support Israel. Right? That's what Harris, Harris was saying in, in her debate. I watched the debate. I mean, it was an interesting debate, isn't it? Did you have fun? I mean, it was, it was, it, it was amazing because, because you could see the contrast. Okay, you could see the contrast. You could see what is fresh, new future against old and 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 uh, uh, you know uh, no program, no ideas, no fresh idea. Talking about the past, not talking about the future, not talking about what's good for the people in the streets maybe good for the people in the in their own private jet but not talking to the people in the streets whatsoever they are not they don't exist okay so you can see the contrast right away and uh i think one of the problems uh that one of the candidates has is that uh, he was used to uh, curse and 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 try to make fun of Biden, and suddenly you know he's trying to give fist to somebody who, who doesn't exist anymore over there. So the, the the fists are hitting the air, and there's nobody there, and it's confusion there. What do I do? So we, I believe that any president of the United States, any of them will always support Israel. And that's important to say, any president of the United States, or every president, and any president of the United States that will be elected will support Israel as long as Israel is going to be democracy. That's a point that we must understand and accept. And if we will not be a democracy, God forbid, I mean, we're gone. Because we have our best friend, our best ally uh, is the United States. And, uh, and it's not the United States doesn't see the wrongdoing of, of Israel. And it doesn't mean the United States is supporting the wrongdoing of Israel. And it's rightfully so. Rightfully so, the United States does not, support, do not, does not have to support things that are wrong that I believe also wrong, okay? So you have this little kid, this, this troublemaker, and you put him in line. And I hope Biden was trying to do that. So we need a, a president like that in the United States that knows right from wrong and make sure that the friends of the United States behave within the same standards did that president wish for the United States? Well, thank you, Benny. We're out of time. We're going to have to leave it there. Thanks so much to our guest, Benny Ron. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Thanks to everyone for watching. Aloha.